Well, good evening, everyone. We're delighted to have you all here tonight, and it's a full house, so thank you very much for your interest and your support of DASI, who's done a remarkable job to produce this book after years of work, uh, after COVID, um, and we're just so thrilled to finally be able to get this book out to market, so thank you for coming. And DASI will open tonight's proceedings with a short reading. Thank you all for being here. I decided it was time to demystify mental health in my community. While in Israel, I had learned about Facebook and set up a private account to stay in contact with Dahlia overseas. My friend list had grown with Ellie, Isaac and Ben's contacts now that they had left the community. I posted a picture of my room tagging Albert Road Psychiatric Clinic. I knew the information would make its way back to Adas, and it did, fairly quickly. I felt little for anything but that small act of rebellion tasted sweet. As an unexpected benefit of this exposure, I was added to a list of community members in hospital, and each morning a box of pastries from the kosher bakery was delivered to my ward. Although I had started eating non-kosher, I still primarily ate the packaged plain-style kosher food that the hospital offered, so these fresh treats were a welcome addition to our limited diet. One evening, I sat in the playroom when another mum's partner entered the room. I felt awkward about sharing a space with an unrelated male, so I stood up to leave, but the mums convinced me to stay. Half an hour later, I was sitting on the couch having what appeared to be, to most people, a normal conversation, except the entire experience was far outside my norm. When the man found out I didn't know a thing about football, he spent half an hour trying to make me understand. I still didn't get it. Don't be weird, I kept telling myself. Speak like you would to any other acquaintance. It was my first casual conversation with a man who was not my husband. Afterwards, I went to my room and stared in the mirror. I saw the way I appeared to the mums, headscarf on my head, skirt covering my knees, thick tights and a modest top. The way I dressed no longer reflected the way I behaved. I had been brought up with a presumption of superiority told that non-Jewish people were drunks and drug addicts needing something to fill up their empty lives. But here, all I saw were mums, loving, kind and honest, struggling like I was. The us versus them mentality was beginning to recede. I tore off the headscarf I was wearing to an alternative to the wig and studied the, women, the woman looking back at me. My thoughts were almost crushing in their intensity. Did this feel more like me? Would my marriage survive if I went week free? Did covering my hair really make me a better person? I contemplated this for several minutes, exploring the idea that everything I had been brought up with wasn't as absolute as I believed. Questioning my beliefs brought a strong sense of danger, but instead of feeling scared, I felt an eagerness to push it further. Thanks, Dassie. There's a lot going on in that anecdote. And where you actually open that, you say that you want to demystify mental health and you want to shine a light on mental health. Why was that important to you? I think being in the community and actually when I was in hospital, meeting two other women in the community that were in hospital with me and having absolutely no idea that other adust women went to hospital, and gossip being such a strong part of the community actually really surprised me that that was something that I didn't know. There was such a stigma around mental health. And even in the broader community, even once I left the community, I realised there was still such a stigma around mental health, especially as someone that has suffered, um, that has struggled with self-harm and suicidality and hearing remarks from people around how, you know, suicidality is just for attention seeking or, I felt that it was very important to really try and talk about the impact of abuse on my mental health throughout this whole book and talk about it not just from a, I think, as a society, we've moved forward and realised that sexual abuse has a huge impact on people's lives, but talk about it from a very personal perspective to, to, to understand how that can affect someone and how, how someone can heal from that. And that was very important for me to, to write about. How difficult 
was it for you to write this book? Did you find it cathartic or was it actually very painful to take such a close look at some of your personal history? I actually thought that it was going to be really easy to write this book. I mean, this is, it's my history, it's my life, it's something I'm very, uh, you know, I know a lot about and I thought I did anyway. I actually realised that trying to write my childhood um, and trying to write trauma and trying to understand and trying to go back into my younger self and write from that perspective was something incredibly difficult. The way trauma works, I think, you know, we don't have a chance to process those memories. And for me personally, they, I disassociated from a lot of those memories. So I didn't have, I didn't, there was large chunks of my childhood that I didn't have. And a lot of the memories that I do write about are actually about my siblings because those are the memories that I do have. But having to go back and sit in that space in my young child self and write about that was something much harder. I mean, I actually couldn't do... I actually couldn't even sit and do that for a whole year. And Ellen ended up interviewing me so we could kind of get an idea of, of what my childhood was like. And I looked at that interview and I said, yeah, that's not going to work at all. So I sat for another whole year in front of the computer, day after day, just trying to put down some words of my childhood. And in order to do that, I had to actually go and sit and revisit those memories that I was terrified of, of looking at. And it, once I was able to do that, I found it incredibly cathartic. Can you share a couple of those memories with us from your very early childhood? That's, that's a more difficult thing to do. But, and I do write quite a few memories um, as, as a young child in the community, in my parents' home, who were very abusive uh, and used religion as a, as a tool of abuse as well. And I, I have this... Uh, I was just talking to my sisters before and we, had, we were just thinking about this memory of, you know, being so little. And I think that at some point we got some Tamagotchis or some um, Game Boys or something. You know, there was nothing wrong. There's nothing... You know, they weren't connected to the internet or anything. They were just... We were just playing games on them. I don't, I don't even know how we came across them. But I remember my mother gath gathering us around and having us all watch as she completely destroyed them with a hammer in front of us and saying that these were against religion in some way. They weren't. That was a part of her abuse. But making us sit there and, and watch her do that, and that was something that was a common theme. She was, she was very abusive, and when she would abuse myself or one of my siblings, she would make us all watch. And, um, yeah, that was not something that I like to remember. Yeah, it's been tough. And your siblings also went through many, if not all, of these things with you. And five of those siblings are here tonight in the front row. Um, lovely to have you here. And I feel like... <laughs> I feel like, from what I know of uh, Dassie, that part of the reason she's sitting here being as amazing as she is is because of the support she's had from you guys. What do you think, Dassie? Absolutely. I literally would not be here without the support of my siblings. As very young children, we were pitted against each other quite often. And as young children, we didn't know any better. But as we grew older and we started to understand that that was something... We, the only people we had were each other. And when we were pitted against each other, we would go and apologise to each other afterwards. And in a way, that was our sense of rebelliousness. As teenagers, we had no other way to rebel but to kind of come together and be each other's support system. And we were. And for a long time, we just had those trauma bonds. But as adults, we've created other... We've created, you know, strong adult bonds. And sometimes we go away as siblings together without our... Uh, um, partners or kids and we just enjoy being in each other's space and just really enjoying each other's company. And family in many ways is a wonderful force for good but in some circumstances it can be a force for bad as well, can't it? I think as adults we like to go out into the world and think that we have this autonomy and you know the way that we behave and the way that we are have nothing to do with how we were brought up. 
But when I had to start life all over again and had to really consider what, who was I as an adult and who was I as a person and realise that I carried all these beliefs about my self-worth, about not, e not even being able to say no, and I had to undo a lot of those things that I was carrying into adulthood, it, it made me realise how much family has a huge impact. And one of the strategies that you had for keeping yourself safe as a very young child was being silent. Um, you wouldn't talk, you wouldn't raise your voice, you didn't want to draw attention to yourself. And yet, as a young adult, you found your voice, you laid a complaint against Malka Leifer with the police, and uh, earlier than that, you disclosed the abuse to a therapist in Israel. So how do you go from being that little girl who won't say boo at school and won't speak up at home to having that voice? The first, the first time I ever spoke about the abuse was to Hannah Rabinowitz when I disclosed and that led to a whole trigger chain of events with Mal Khalifa leaving the country. But I don't consider that as finding my voice. If anything, it was just completely enveloped in silence again. We didn't, I didn't speak about it in my marriage and I didn't speak, the community was completely silent about it. And I felt, I, I, I I really regretted saying something, even though I knew it was the right thing. The impact that it had had on, on, on my life and my family made me utterly terrified to say anything ever again. And it was when I had my daughter and looking at her innocent face and realising that I was bringing her into a world that, that there, were, there were values I didn't agree with and seeing her innocence and knew that, and knew, I knew that I had choices that I could make that could change that. I had a voice initially for her and it took me a long time to find that voice for myself. And one of the ways that you did that was choosing to publicly identify yourself as a victim or a survivor of Malka Leifer by coming out in the media and, and putting your face and your name to that story. I remember when Cam Stewart from The Australian, he knocked on my door one morning and it was early 2016 and 2015 I had just finished the fight, you know, to, well, I just finished the civil case against the school, but also I had, been, had spent years fighting for the right to parent my child. And he knocked on my door asking me to identify myself. At that point, there was nothing I wanted less. I literally I slammed the door in his face. And he's apologised several times since then. But that, I just wanted a normal life. I wanted, I wanted to finish my uni degree. I wanted to parent my child. I wanted to just get on with life and have a normal life. I wasn't ready to look at that shame that I was still carrying around and actually examine why I was still why I still had that shame and and move through it but after a year of road tripping and skydiving and going and 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 moving and going back to uni and finishing my degree and meeting beautiful people and beautiful friends I realized that that shame wasn't mine it was actually hers and I was willing to put my name to that story, I had no idea what, what that meant or what that would bring or where that would go. But I just knew that that shame wasn't mine anymore. Mm. And you have been fighting for 15 years to get justice. That is a very, very long time for anyone that's ever tried to push something through a, a legal system. You fought the school originally, you fought silence within the community, you've lobbied the Australian Parliament and you've lobbied the Israeli Parliament and you fought the Israeli justice system. Where did you find the courage to do that? That's a big question. <laughs> I think I didn't know what I didn't know that I had the courage until I had to face until I had to face what I, what I needed to do. But it was having, well, having my sister, doing it together with my sisters, and I think that, you know, having the, us three being together and being able to do it together uh, was what got us through those very, very long years. And then meeting people like Ted Bailey, who I can see here in the audience, and, and having him stand up and give credit to our story and then people coming together and so many people and so many voices coming together to 
to, to, show, to show society that we weren't just going to allow this person who had manipulated the system for so long and, and manipulated all of us to continue to manipulate the, the justice system. And it really was people coming together and raising their voices and amplifying our cause that is the reason that we got here today. So that collective activism as such. So you're talking there about the support you got from politicians, state and federal across the political divide. You're talking about community activists and individuals. Oh, absolutely. I think it just, it still amazes me to look back at that journey and realise the people that have come together to, to ensure justice happened. And you saw that on your social media when you started in the very early days and you just had a few followers and then more and more people came along and started commenting on your social media pages and then they joined the fight, didn't they? They joined the fight for justice and to get Malka Leifer extradited. It was just... It's, it's actually incredible to realise what people coming together can do and I remember at one point we had... Malka Leifer was was potentially going to be given bail and she was granted bail and she was and and she did have some very incredibly um, prominent people in Israel standing up for her and saying you know some rabbi walking into court and saying that he would uh, he would he would ensure that she um, he would ensure that she would uh, stay at his place and he would supervise her and that it's wrong for a woman to be in prison and the amount of anger that poured out from people from knowing that this person had stood up on behalf of an abuser and that she would be given bail and we knew that if she left prison there was no way that the case was, would ever continue. She would flee the country. We, we, were, we were very aware of that. And the people that came together to, to right that wrong was just absolutely incredible to see. And eventually that rabbi did pull back and decide not to, uh, not to um, support her bail and her bail was refused but I just, I remember sitting in bed that evening and just thinking, we're not alone anymore. Like for so long, we, it felt like we had been alone and we weren't alone anymore. Like there was all these people that were willing to take up our cause and willing to, to right this wrong. And that even if there were so many people supporting her, there was more people supporting what was right. And that was an incredible moment. Did that scared little girl ever think she'd grow into a woman who would be speaking to prime ministers and former state premiers and stalking the halls of the Knesset in Israel? Never, never, ever could, could have imagined a life like that, so beyond anything I could have imagined. And actually, very often when I'm in situations like that, I'll kind of just step back and, and look at that from the from the eyes of my younger self and think, you know, who could have ever imagined I would be here? And there's a sense of pride in that. Yeah, there should be. In some ways, the ultra-Orthodox community in Melbourne is quite visible, um, particularly in the suburbs where that community mainly lives, but actually it's quite a closed community and those of us who are not from within that faith don't know much about it. There is a lot of information in this book about how people live, and it's absolutely fascinating. How important was it to you to get some of those stories out and bring a bit of light into an otherwise very closed community? I think I could have written ten books <laughs> about, about life in the community and the way that, that life works. I mean, from, from the second you wake up and which way to get out of bed and, and how to wash your hands and how to lean over the bed in the right way. I mean, the community governed our life from morning to evening and it would have been impossible to fit that all into one book. But I tried to give as much as possible a sense of what day-to-day -day life was in the most authentic way that I could, rather from my critical adult self, from going back to my younger self and trying to give, give an understanding of what life was like as a young child in that community. There are anecdotes in there where on one occasion you're like, I'm not going to eat bread because the blessings are too long afterwards and I can't be bothered. <laughs> and it was, and it, that did happen very often. It would take us several minutes to, to make a blessing after bread and sometimes it was just easier not to eat bread. <laughs> <laughs> So I think people will find that really interesting. The, it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating look inside a, a, a culture that really we don't see. And the Sydney Morning Herald um, wrote a very interesting review, actually, but they described it as your journey as leaving a cult. Do you agree with that assessment? 
I'm a bit hesitant to use the word cult. I think there are very, uh, that kind of brings up this idea of, you know, uh, some person and usually it's some white guy with, you know, that's very manipulative and likes to exploit other people. And this is a way of life. And even though there is cult-like qualities uh, to the community and the insularity of the community, and leaving the community was something that was very, in some ways, when I've read books about cults, I found I found points of that that resonate a lot with me. But I don't like to use the word cult. It is it is a way of life, and as insular as it is, it's it's not a cult. And there've been various milestones along the way that have been. Um very important turning points in your life. One of them was when you first heard that Malka Leifel was arrested in Israel. Can you remember where you were when you heard that and how you felt? I remember being in, I think it was Rome. I was in Rome with my sister, Ellie. And at that point in the system, at that point we knew the extradition order had gone to Israel and it was you know, two or three years later, and we hadn't heard anything from Israel, and for all intents and purposes, we believed that the case was never going to continue. We didn't think at that point that there was anything we could do to, to, to make that happen. And we were in Israel, uh, sorry, we were in Rome, and I just remember getting that news. It was such a, it was, it was so sudden that we had no time to prepare ourselves for that suddenly to come into our lives. I mean, we were travelling around, being Taurus, the thought of Malkalai for the furthest thing from my mind. Um, and I, I remember talking to Nicole on the phone and saying, should we, should we come back home? You know, we just wanted to be together to support each other through that moment. And ultimately we decided that we'll continue touring because we loved being Taurus and we didn't want to be Malkalai as victims. But all through that trip, I remember hearing gossip coming through the Jewish communities around the world to say, you know, that these were irreligious people that were making up stories. And I just remember sitting on the beach in Barcelona with Ellie and having a drink and just, you know, looking at, looking at those messages and just toasting to the fact that we were on a beach, you know, in, in bikinis, in, in having a life that no one... <laughs> I think um, your response to some of the criticism where people said, oh, you, you, you girls are just doing this for the money, and you're like, what money? There's no money in this. Or you're doing it for the fame, and you say, who would want this kind of fame? So um, the, the, the criticism from that tiny group that continues to support her um, has remained. But then the next step along the path was you get the message that she's going to be extradited and she's on her way to Australia. How did you feel then? That was the end of such a huge, long, long journey, a, a point that we actually thought that we would never see. It was completely, it was a completely surreal moment. And I think until she touched down in Australia, we actually didn't believe that it would happen. And how did you get that news? Can you tell us? Uh, the news of her coming back was, it was, it was January and we were, told, we were told by the prosecutor in Israel that this is the one thing he absolutely cannot tell us. I mean, he had called us before and after every single of those 74 court hearings in Israel and explained the law to us and what we could expect. So when he told us this was the one thing that he couldn't tell us, we didn't really believe him. We thought that maybe, you know, he could, he could let us know. But Australia and Israel, Israel were quite worried that there would be some efforts made to, to intervene. And so they kept that a complete ironclad secret that no one would know. And that photo that was taken of Mal Khalifa on the airplane, um, you know, in handcuffs with the police officer standing next to her, that was not a picture that was ever meant to be seen. It was some other person in the airport. Um, that just saw that moment and thought, oh, this is, <laughs> this is something um, I can share with the world, took that photo and promptly sold it to the news. And that's how we found out that Malka Life was coming back to Australia. And, of course, the other great milestone was after the trial, she's found guilty and sentenced to jail. And you write in the book that you felt that you'd spent... 15 years walking towards something and now you could start walking away from it. 
What feeling did you have the day that verdict was handed down? I remember writing that line in my diary. You know, this is this. I remember waking up that morning, and actually, I had woken up and I was in a psychiatric hospital again, and looking at my life and realizing that no matter that I had spent so long in my life walking towards this moment of justice, really every moment since I had given my police statement, every moment since she had abused me was walking towards this moment. And there was such a sense of freedom in knowing that I was actually walking away from this. I was, I was, it was behind me. I was looking, I was looking at it behind me when so, for so long it had been there in front of me. It was such a sense of relief, such a sense of freedom, such a sense of, of curiosity of, of what's going to come next. And Dassie very casually says there, I was in a psychiatric hospital again. Um, I think what people will discover when you read the book is that Dassie's mental health has been so fragile that she's had multiple stays in a psychiatric hospital and, in fact, managed to get through that trial um, while spending the evenings and the nights in the clinic, weren't you? Well, I had, I had been to that clinic in and out in 2011, 2012, and I hadn't been back there um, until the trial. And I think, you know, going through the trial, I went through that with my sisters, with my family around me, with, with an incredible amount of support and, and people around me, friends and an awesome prosecution team, an awesome police. And still it's traumatised me to the point that I ended up in hospital. And that's the system. That's, it's not made for survivors at all. Mm. And you felt very much that um, one trauma was being used to, to play off against another trauma as part of the, the justice process? I think being, being on the stand and having my childhood examine, have, there was nothing that was out of bounds, absolutely nothing that was out of bounds. And the insinuation was... You know, surely that because I had been abused already, I must have somehow know, known that I was being abused. It was everything was was there to to be used for Mal Khalifa, and it really felt that I was back in her world again when I was on the stand. And it, it there's so much that still needs to change with the system. The fact that I can be questioned about my character and everything my entire life be torn apart, um, my therapy records be, um, uh, be subpoenaed, uh, a draft of this book was subpoenaed, uh, messages between friends were subpoenaed, while she can sit there and have, and have character witnesses that, that talk about her character that somehow help mitigate her sentence. It just, it's so wrong and it shouldn't be like that. I think one of the things you've done here is expose wrongdoing in many aspects, and one of them is the way that the uh, parts of the school community responded when it became obvious there'd been a complaint to police, and um, she was put basically on the next plane to Israel at one o'clock the next morning. How did you feel when you found out that had happened? I actually didn't know how that played out until my civil case and I was sitting there in court and, and hearing that all play out. It was an absolute, it was shocking and I remember just escaping to the bathroom multiple times to go and scream into my hands because there was just, it was just, it was just horrifying actually to discover how she had been paid to leave and to know that she was in a position to hurt other people and that didn't seem to be a concern for the people that had sent her away. Did you feel betrayed by that? Absolutely. We're going to come to audience questions shortly, so please put your thinking caps on because we'd love to, um, to hear your questions. But before we do, Dassie, what's life like on the outside? <laughs> a life that I could have never imagined. Um, one of, actually, one of my favourite things to do is just to head out onto the road and go on a road trip and have no idea where I'm going. And the idea of just being able to you know, stop at some random town and have a little coffee and, and some lunch is something that I could have never imagined doing 
any, all of my life and it's something that I actually really enjoy doing. What about all those things like getting speeding fines, <laughs> eating McDonald's? <laughs> all of that too. <laughs> <laughs> We won't give away too many of those secrets then, perhaps. And what's this about skydiving? Well, one of my brothers uh, introduced me to that and I've tried it once and definitely I think we plan to do that in a few weeks again. And it's something that's just utterly thrilling. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Dassie, you're here now. The book is launched. Um, you've got through the writing process. It took three years. How are you feeling now? There's, there's a sense of life being open now, of there's a sense of, I feel like my sense of curiosity is back, something that I, I didn't have for many years. And it's exciting to look at the future and know that there's choices I can make so different than the one that was, the life that was preordained for me. Well, thank you for sharing that with us tonight and we look forward to uh, taking some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's actually pitch dark, so I can't tell if anyone's got their hands up or uh, have a question for us. Maybe the Wheeler Centre can help us out. <laughs> hello. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much. That was uh, very in interesting and entertaining. Um, my question is, um, did you have a say in the title of the book? Where did the title come from? But also, do you think that the people who perpetrated the crimes, Malka Leifer in particular, did so a a out of a sense of faith? Or where do you think that came from, from for her? Thank you. So with the title of the book, um, the publisher actually chose bad faith. And I wasn't, I didn't love that idea. I was sitting in the car with Nicole and she suggested in bad faith. And I said, oh, I'd like that idea a lot more. And here we are, in bad faith. With, sorry, the other question was about faith and are you talking about the people um, that have sent, that sent Malka Leifer away? So I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to consider how, how, why that happened, why did that happen that she was sent away and how that played into, into faith. And it really was the silence. It really was about silence. We just didn't talk about those things, and to send something, to send someone away, was the easiest thing to do. And that was that was the way that a lot of problems were dealt with in the community. We just didn't talk about it, and we just didn't we just didn't consider it, and we just tried to shove it under the carpet as far as it would, it could go. And that was a lot of, about the culture of the community. Thank you. Sorry, there's some roving microphones out there somewhere, I think. Lots of hands in the front. Darcy, um, may I ask you if it's not too difficult, um, the character of your m mother, um, have you come to any conclusion about why she is like she is? Or was like she was? I think there's a lot of intergenerational trauma and I've tried to understand my mother from that perspective. Um, there's obviously reasons why she was the way that she was based on her childhood and, and her experiences. But then I also look at my daughter and realise that, you know, no matter what, what I went through, I could never imagine hurting my child like that and that's really where my understanding ends. Uh, hi, Darcy. Um, being the role model that, that you are right now, do you believe that other people who are in similar situations to what, what you were in are beginning to come forward? I, I think I've seen a lot, this huge groundswell in the last few years from, you know, even from the Royal Commission into institutional abuse, other people coming forward. And a society, I believe, that is believing victims a lot more and willing to and, and willing to bolster those victims. So I, I think that we're, we're seeing a lot more voices being heard and it's very heartening to see. I 
think one of the areas that um, we might be talking about in the future is better ways that, that victim survivors can be supported in court because one of the things, of course, is that you can be on the stand being cross-examined and then it comes to the weekend and you have to go away for the weekend and you're not allowed to talk to anyone and then you have to come back a couple of days later the following week, which is incredibly difficult, isn't it? So there are, there are plenty of conversations, I think, to have about how the courts can do better. Me? Oh. Um, Darcy, thank you very much. Um, I, I can't say I'm going to look forward to reading the book, but I'm sure it's amazing. I have a question for you to ask. There's love, faith and hope. I'm not a religious person, uh, but I've worked with many families who are. But at what stage did you actually lose hope? And was it multiple times? That's a, a tough question to answer because I'm trying to think back, when did I lose hope? And wondering if I ever had hope to begin with. Um, but I definitely, as I grew older, I had that hope. And in the book, I talk about that path towards healing and, and hope was a part of that, of, of hoping that things could be different and knowing that they could be different. Oh, hello, Darcy. I just want to say you're beautifully articulate about your experiences, so thank you for sharing that. I was interested in your reflections on motherhood, but I actually wanted to ask you about the writing experience because it's not just your story that you've told. It involves your family and your community. How, how did you manage that process of being in a, in a kind of biographical or memoir scenario? And I'm guessing that your editor might have helped you as well, but how did you, how did you find that writing process? And is there another book in Dassey? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> um, actually, because it did involve other people, uh, my book, especially my siblings, that was something that I sat down and talked with them and I showed them particularly the childhood chapters and asked them if they were OK with what I had written about my childhood because that was also their childhood. Um, and they gave me feedback and I changed if I had to. But it was, it was an incredibly difficult process and it, it took a long time. I think there was one point that I didn't write for a year. Um, I, I would keep, I kept opening the computer and just couldn't do it. Yeah. Why don't you um, say where you started, the first chapter that you wrote? Well, actually, actually the first chapter that I wrote was about my sister Dahlia and her death and that, that chapter came out. Immediately, the emotions were very present. I wasn't in any way disassociated from, from those memories. And it was something I desperately wanted to write about. And I think I kind of wrote almost the whole middle of the book. Um, and for a long time, that's where it stayed until I was able to write my childhood. And then it was actually after the trial that I wrote the rest of the book. Excuse me. Uh, Darcy, deriving out of something you said before in relation to uh, <coughs> Lifer uh, being moved out of the country, to your knowledge at the moment, are police still investigating the possibility of charging the board or members of the board, those who are still alive? And the second question, if I may ask, and I may have missed this with, with, because of my poor hearing, um, are you aware of other people of your generation who were abused by LIFA but were reluct are reluctant, of course, to come forward because of the, the community ties, the strong community ties? Um, I, I am aware of other victims, uh, some of them that were in contact with us during the trial, uh, wanting to know the outcome as, as much as we did. Uh, but th uh, the rest of the victims stay within the community and that would jeopardise their place in the community by coming forward. So they haven't come forward. Um, and in relation to your question about the police investigation into the board, that is open. I 
I think with regards to that um, police investigation, there was some pressure applied um, on the police, Dassey, is that right? For them to reconsider their, their decision not to, initial decision not to proceed. So the police did uh, announce after the trial that they were not investigating the board and uh, it was Ted Bailey and Philip Deladakis wrote a letter to the police commissioner explaining why that was a terribly wrong decision, a brilliantly worded letter, um, and the police have reopened the case. Uh, Dassey, I've read your book and it left me angry, sad, upset, all a range of emotions and obviously probably that was how you were at the time too or part of it. Um, you said that your daughter, looking at your daughter was a very strong motivating force for you to go ahead and be so open and honest. Um, do you think now looking at her life that she will not have to endure a, a lot of the difficulties that you did? Can you see a, a bright future for her? I can contrive, I mean, you know, children. They go off and have their own lives. As much as possible, I've tried to create a safer world for her and and give her the space to, to grow and be exposed to, to the world that, um, that wasn't as, as closed and insular. And my hope is that you know, she has, she has, she can make those choices as an adult and um, and have the life that she wants. And I'll be there to support her. And that's the most I can do for her. D Darcy, I, it's, it's Abe here. I want to again congratulate you on the courage that everybody is seeing in you. And I want to take you to your remark about when you first disclosed it to the public media about the abuse and the courage that that took for you. And I'm going to take you to the moment in the Jewish community, to the Limud conference, a Jewish community conference for those in the room that aren't, haven't heard of Limud. Was that the first time that you disclosed it purely to the Jewish community? Because I remember sitting in the audience and then you came on my radio program later, later that evening. Because what was the difference between the courage of going out generally to a community that didn't know you, didn't know a DAS, didn't know anything about the community, and then is there a distinction of how you felt doing it for the first time to the Jewish community? Well, that's an interesting question, but I think I remember speaking at that Limud conference and it was the first time that I had considered that there were other parts of the Jewish community that did support us because up until that point, you know, I knew, I knew about the Jewish community that I had grown up within, which was so separate from the wider Jewish community. And having that support from the wider Jewish community was very powerful. Uh, Darcy, I uh, just wanted to firstly congratulate you on sharing your writing your story and sharing your story um, you're wonderfully create uh, courageous and strong um, I just wanted to ask many people say that once the trial is done that that's the end of the story and you can get on with your life but for many victims it's sometimes just the beginning I just wanted to know when you're by yourself, have you found an inner peace that you can sit with um, and look forward to the future with, with love and, and hope? I have. And I think that's part of, uh, part of what I try to write about in the book. You know, there is hope and there is healing. And um, I do have those moments of peace, of, of inner peace um, that I feel. And, and that's part of the journey. And while I'm aware that when someone faces a significant amount of trauma, there's always going to be an impact on my life, um, I've come so much further and being able to understand how that impacts my life and what I can do about it and, um, and really be on that healing journey. And, Dassie, one of the things you love to do is um, try and have a nice garden. It's something that you're aspiring to. You have uh, foster cats, 
and that's where you tend to find a bit of peace with the cats and the garden and your neighbour. I have a very vocal foster cat at the moment, probably meowing at the door waiting for me to come home tonight. Okay, no peace but... from the foster cats, but the garden? <laughs> the garden is beautiful and actually a, a, a plant that hasn't flowered for around three years flowered this morning, so that was really nice to see. Thank you so much, Dassey. Um, I'm wondering, because obviously the ADAS community hasn't taken any responsibility and um, potentially haven't looked into their culture of silence, um, I suppose my question is, uh, have you got any thoughts on how we protect um, or what we do for the children and the future children that go through that community and other communities that are also um, insular? Um, and, yeah, how we protect and prevent this from happening again. I think a, a big culture shift needs to happen, um, and I talk about this in the book, and I have been um, working with Pathways, which is an organisation that helps people that are leaving the community, and um, we're actually currently working on a project of trying to understand how we can help young, vulnerable teenagers... Uh, that are either questioning religion or are leaving home, uh, what, what more can we do for them? And it's something that, that we're definitely working very hard towards because it's not good enough that as a community we have, we have young, vulnerable people and we're not, we're not there to support them. In terms of your engagement with the secular community while you were a member of ADAS, um, there was one instance where your your parents called the police because you'd had a break-in. But actually, the community is designed not to have involvement with the outside world, isn't it? So when you're going through something like you are, you're dealing with the secular community, you're dealing with sexual abuse, and you're also leaving the community at the same time. I, I remember my parents calling the police, and we were sent to our rooms because, you know, the influence of someone from outside of the community could have on us from just seeing them and, and being exposed to them was too great, and so we couldn't be around them. But, yeah. But you put that, your faith in the secular community, didn't you, in the end? I did put my faith in the, in the justice system, or the legal system, I should say, and... <laughs> Ultimately, we know how that worked out. Well, you did get justice in the end, and justice was done. There was a policewoman that was important in this. Oh, absolutely. Um, Danielle took Danielle Newton. She couldn't be here tonight. She would have loved to be, but she took my first police statement and she um, actually went and had a whole another career and well, another career in policing and came back and picked up the case and was the person to pick up Leifa from Israel all those years later. Hi, Dussie. Um, it would be very easy to lose one's faith after what happened to you. Um, what role does religion, Jewish religion play in your life now? For a long time, um, I wanted nothing to do with religion. Um, I still don't know what I want, um, where, what religion means to me, but it's not something that, you know, I'm running away from. It's something that I'm trying to, to figure out for myself. It's still a journey that I'm on. Darcy, thank you very much, and um, we're in awe of you and your, and your siblings for your courage, and Ellen, well done for you and your part in telling this story um, as well. The, you talked about being in court and the imbalance between you know, the rights of the, of the victims and, and also the rights of the perpetrator. How do, we, how do we get that balance? How do we send that message to the courts that we need to treat victims a lot better than we have been? I mean, how do I answer that in, in one sentence? But I think we need an overhaul of the whole system. Um, there's so much that still needs to change. Now, I remember sitting in a court in America. Um, my, uh, my sister Nicole and I were there and we were there in support of another victim. And they have a different system where it's guilty until you're proven innocent. And that seemed to work a lot better for victims. I know that that's not the system we have. <laughs> 
bad. They're, they're, a lot needs to change. Do we have any other questions? I can't quite see. Yes? Thank you, Dassie. Um, we're not used to thinking about women as being child sex offenders. I'm wondering if you have any thought or comment about how much, if at all, you think the perpetrator's gender had in the extraordinary difficulty you had in um, your journey toward justice. I think her faith versus her gender would play more of a bigger part in people coming together to prevent her from coming back to Australia. So I think I think that had a, a lot more it was a lot more about the community not wanting to for for many different reasons, not wanting her to be dealt with in a secular court system or not not even believing that it happened to start with. Sorry, I, f I forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> So I, th I think that, that what we're addressing there is whether the fact that she was a woman meant that it was dealt with differently or that people perceived it differently. And I think actually Dassie tells a story in the book where, um, where she first um, revealed that she'd been abused and the, the person that you spoke to was that they were running it through their mind and going, but how did a man get access to you at the school? So they assumed that it was a man. But, but of course it wasn't. And... and the devastation, really, when it was discovered that it was a woman and the leader of the school. And, and I have got comments from various people or, or religious leaders that have said, you know, it's just, a, it's just a woman, you know, what's, you know, who cares kind of thing. Um, obviously, uh, the impact of the abuse and the power and the mani mani manipulation and the betrayal is the same regardless of the gender but that's still something that people have struggled to understand. Some questions at the front, please. Thanks. Darcy, uh, Ted Bailey, um, can I just say it's been uh, a privilege to meet you all and to be able to stand bes beside you um, over the recent years. Thank you, Ted. In the course of the trial, one of the oddities was that the jury wasn't allowed to know anything about the 74 uh, hearings in Israel, wasn't allowed to know anything about the civil case. And certainly I'm of the view if, if they had known that uh, there would have been some additional convictions, let's just put it that way. But one of the most powerful things that I've read aside from your book, which is extraordinarily powerful, and you used that word yourself just before, was the judgment that Jack Rush, Justice Rush, made in the civil case. And if people have an opportunity to read that beside your book, it's incredibly instructive. Uh, brave of the justice at the time, the trial took place under the spotlight, the civil case not quite so much. But I just wonder, looking back, what you think about that judgment? The civil case judgment was... That was actually an incredible judgment. And it was the first time that I had said anything in court about the abuse. Um, and for that response, to, to get su such a response, and I think I show how much it meant to me by putting quite a bit of it in the book, but it was incredibly empowering and incredibly validating. And for and for the way that the judge uh, spoke about how the school had, had acted and how they had sent her away and the words that he used to describe their behaviour was, was incredibly validating to hear and it was something that, was, that meant a lot to me. I think one of the orders from that was that Malka Leifer individually make a payment to you. Did she ever pay? No. <laughs> We've got time for one, maybe two more questions, if there's any more. Up the front here. Could you find forgiveness or compassion to 
any of those people that hurt you in your life? Aren't you? I think that's a question that I've been asked over the years and it's something that I've really considered about forgiveness. And I've realised that I had to forgive myself first and that was something that I had to learn to do um, and, and give forgiveness for the blame that I, that I felt for myself and that I felt was the most important journey rather than considering forgiveness. And maybe that will be a part of my future, I don't know. But... I think working on forgiveness for myself was what was more important. Anything further? Sorry, I don't want to cut anyone off because I can't see under this light. So, um, so. If everyone's finished there, what we might do is um, wrap it up and say thank you very much, um, all of you, for coming along and um, showing support to Dassie. I'm sure you'll agree with me that she is a wonder woman. She's so brave and to watch what she's gone through. Um, I've only really been involved with her the last three or four years. There are people here who've been with her all of her life and she is one very brave cat. Um, so... Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And for being a part of that change that we want to see in society and for sparking those conversations and for ensuring that we have a more compassionate society as a whole. So thank you for coming, thank you for supporting our journey and thank you for supporting my book. So thank you to the Wheeler Centre for hosting us. Thank you to our amazing publisher, Vanessa, who's been with us every step of the way. And Dassey will be signing books at the back. So um, for those who would like to have a quick chat to Dassey and get her to sign, she'd love to see you um, at the back. Thank you very much. <laughs>